around until you find somewhere you like. However, you can book somewhere to stay here at the terminal tourist office. They speak English and they'll make a telephone reservation for you. OK, I'll book that now and you can drive straight there. 5,000 hotels in France have banded together under the Logis et Auberge scheme. This sign denotes a small, one- or two-star, family-run hotel that will charge from about £12 for a good double room. The Hotel Le Clos Normand in saint aubin sur mer is a seaside logis, and again, English is spoken. Uh, in French hotel, it's uh, normal to inspect your room before you take it. Good, let's yeah. go then. Let's go. <laughs> this costs about £20 a night, but if you didn't want to pay for a view, you could ask for a cheaper room at the back of the hotel. Another characteristic of Logis et Auberge is that they have regional dishes on the menu. Now here that means meat and fish cooked in creamy Norman sauces. But Monsieur Barr says that not many British order that other Normandy speciality. The shame is that no one asks for three palamot de camp. <laughs> I'm not too surprised. Seaside Logis tend to book up quickly in summer, so it's often easier to find a room inland. Rooms at this little auberge, for example, rent for £14 a night for two. It's the sort of place that's ideal if you want total peace and quiet. If you'd rather have a few shops and bars nearby, then in the same price range you can find plenty of small town hotels like the Saint Martin in Croy. Bed and breakfast costs about 16 pounds for two. Always investigate hotel restaurants. The secret of eating inexpensively is to ask for le menu. This is the sort of meal that you'd get on a fixed price menu for just under five pounds. Wine isn't included, and you have to be very careful because it can be just as expensive as in Britain. What you should do is order un piche, which is a jug of house wine, and that's half the price of any bottle of wine. Now, if you'd rather be completely independent and cook your own meals in your own kitchen, then think about renting a gîte. Gîtes are the holiday homes that the French government funds by giving grants to owners to restore old buildings and then rent them out. Most gîtes are in the countryside. They can be cottages, a rebuilt barn, an old farmhouse, or something like this. All gîtes have to provide a fridge, cooker, cooking utensils, and blankets. This house rents for between 95 and 165 pounds a week and sleeps eight. But you'll often find that a put you up in the living room, as here, has to be used as a bed. This one has three bedrooms, including one with an old Normandy bridal bed. Although gîtes are graded, standards vary enormously. This one rents for between 60 and 94 pounds a week. A lot depends, as you can imagine, on the owner's taste, and you take a measure of pot luck when you book. Not all are as enticing inside as they appear from the outside. You also get used to finding bathrooms and lavatories tucked into the most surprising corners. Most gîtes rent by the week, but now an increasing number do weekend rental, including this one at Ulgat, which used to be a barn. Two nights rental, either Friday and Saturday or Saturday and Sunday, works out at just over £51. Not bad if you want to come over for a weekend shopping. Whether you're self-catering or not, one of the highlights of any trip to France, market day. What about the language? Don't let it worry you. Here in Caen, local traders have been encouraged to learn a bit of English to cope with the passengers coming off the new ferry. I would like one kilo of cherries. Certainly, madame. One kilo of cherries. Apparently, many of them are rather nervous about it, just as nervous as we might be of speaking French. Holidaying and shopping in France can be cheap, easy, and very enjoyable. And don't let the language put you off. It's encore mieux. A five-day return on the ferry for two adults plus the car costs 84 to 163 pounds. I'm at London's Gatwick Airport where they're putting the finishing touches to the new North Passenger Terminal and this brand new transit system links it to the old part of the airport. The new terminal has taken five years to build and cost 250 million pounds. The first passengers fly in on March the 22nd. On the main concourse is a good range of shops, a bureau de change and a cafe. Take the escalator up to departures and you have what they say is the biggest single duty-free shop in Europe. The terminal has its own car parks, short and long term, and despite the piers, you still have to take a bus for some flights. Above all, this building will mean less congestion throughout the whole of Gatwick. 
But what does the world's newest airport terminal offer the disabled traveller? Anne Davis has been making her own inspection. What do you feel about it, Anne? Well, I'm quite impressed. Automatic doors, good signing, low check-in desks. Oh, thanks very much. Low phones. And an area where those disabled people who need special help can, can wait and be looked after. Uh, one or two bucks, of course, I went to the duty-free shop, could get around it very easily. But alas, I couldn't check out. <laughs> I couldn't even pay for my things and get through. And the other big but is the lavatories for wheelchair users. They have the size. But you know, it amazes me how they still get things wrong, despite the fact that there is a British standard. It is all laid down. But I found the flush was practically out of, out of the way. The lavatory paper on the wall was almost too high to reach. And the alarm bell was feet away. But there we are. But anyway, despite all those snags, I do think it's going to be far easier to go from this airport uh, than any other. That's good news, Anne. The main airline using the new terminal is British Airways. Don't, for instance, if you're booked on Aeroflot going to the Soviet Union, come here. Go to South Terminal. That's what we did when we joined a tour which took us to Moscow and then down to Yalta on the Black Sea. The holiday, in fact, returns via Leningrad, but we left it before that. At first sight, it could be almost anywhere, a typical seaside scene, but a Puritan figure oversees the jollity, Lenin. Yalta is one of the Soviet Union's largest seaside resorts. It's uncommercial and unsophisticated. You'll find it hard to buy even a beer, part of the country's crackdown on alcoholism. In midsummer, the resort is swamped by Soviet holidaymakers. There are constant queues for drinks, snacks, and even a beachside flutter. The state-run roulette helps fund the arts. The limited resort facilities can barely cope with the huge holiday crowds. Finding a proper meal here outside your hotel is virtually impossible. Russia is run for Russians and they're not used to service. For Britons, the system works best if you take a package. One tour is processed through the vast hotel Yalta. To cope with sheer numbers, everything must be run to a strict timetable, but tourist hotels are opening up to Western influences. Compact and comfortable bedrooms with small bathrooms were the best we found, although there's no room service. They have a system for everything. A cursory skin check by the resident doctor is obligatory before you can use the swimming pool. Like the hotel itself, it's on a grand scale. You won't find poolside waiter service, though you can collect drinks from a bar. The hotel's own beach of grey stone is more crowded and more fun too. Foreigners and Russians mingle freely together. Between them, the hotel's 12 bars are open from 8 a.m. to 2 in the morning. An imported beer in a bar that takes only foreign currency costs about £1.20 against 40 pence for sweeter Russian beer in the Rubles bar, but you'll have to queue. In the evening, the tables are cleared for some spirited folk dancing. One excursion in each centre is included in the package price. In Yalta, it's to Alupka Palace, now a museum. With its eccentric mix of Tudor, Arab and classic styles, it preempted Disney by nearly a century. The Crimean coast is as hot as the Mediterranean. Today's palaces are workers' sanatoria, state health spas built high on hillsides scented by pine, rosemary and juniper. The coast is spectacular. They call it the Russian Riviera, but to handle the volume of holidaymakers, excursions must be run like a military operation. One is to the Swallow's Nest. It might be a transplant from the River Rhine, but then it was built by a German out to impress his gypsy mistress. Optional half-day excursions cost about three pounds. This one strikes a recent historic note. Livadia Palace was built by the last Tsar, Nicholas II, in Renaissance style. In 1945, it was the setting for the fateful Yalta Round Table Conference, when Stalin, Churchill and Roosevelt sat down to plan the final defeat of Germany and reshape post-war Europe. Later, they posed for a joint picture in the courtyard, exactly the same now as it was 43 years ago. In Moscow today, not much evidence of Stalin. 
Tourism is being actively encouraged. Most tours start or end in Moscow, a formal city of grand buildings and wide streets washed clean every summer night. You don't get a choice of hotel. The cosmos, some way from the centre, is most often used by packages. This hotel has evolved its own unpredictable way of funnelling 3,400 guests a night through its system, and it has its own set of priorities. Although among the capital's top hotels, its standards are not equal to those in the West. In contrast, the metro is a model of efficiency. Where else would an underground system, or rather its ornate stations, be listed among the major tourist attractions? For five pence, you get unlimited travel. Sightseeing tours can turn Moscow into a museum piece. You can explore freely on your own, but with signs in Russian and Little English spoken, independent travellers have a hard time. Stary Abat, the pedestrian precinct, is now the trendiest street. Private enterprise flourishes. Open-air cafes are just beginning to blossom. But it's the powerful set pieces that impress. Although tightly packaged, the Soviet Union is still a traveller's country. Bureaucracy and lack of flexibility will affect your holiday, but to get the most out of it, you must be prepared to take the rough with the smooth. Moscow's crammed with great monuments to progress and accomplishments. In the exhibition of economic achievement, pavilions, statues and displays show the contributions from the country's different republics. They give a common goal to a land with 130 nationalities, 47 languages and five alphabets. So, does Gorbachev's Russia come up to expectations? I think you do have some sort of preconceived idea of what you're going to see, and it was nothing like what we thought it was going to see. Much freer. It was vastly different from what we expected. We expected the people to be rather oppressed and shabbily dressed, but they were not at all. The people were very friendly indeed. The people appeared to be more relaxed than they were in Moscow. The accommodation varied um, from what I would say was mediocre to very good. We've been in three hotels now and all the rooms have been fine. Good standard accommodation, clean, yeah. lots of hot water, no problems whatsoever. Plumbing is a bit outdated. I think it's uh, very much organised for the group and very little done for the individual. Uh, everything has gone without any hitches at all. The problem is, if you went on your own, you, you wouldn't have a hope unless you understood Russian. We've, we, we've had a marvellous holiday. Mar absolutely marvellous. <laughs> week holiday with four nights in Moscow, a week in Yalta and three nights in Leningrad costs from 560 to 590 pounds between May and October. All flights, meals, accommodation and some sightseeing are included and those prices are guaranteed. Back here in Gatwick's new north terminal, this is the baggage reclaim area. They tell me that the baggage check system they're using means there's more chance of you and your luggage finishing up in the same place. That's a good idea. For our final report, John Carter went to Wales, to Putheli, where on the Flame Peninsula you feel very much in a foreign country. Rodri Wethi, Gwynaid Hyn, Drosser Beer. On Hidun Hin, Pobamser, in Saizni. Which means, I hope, I've done this all over the world, but until now, always in English. It's a reminder, like this great castle here at Cricketh, that this is a very Welsh part of Wales. In fact, you'll hear the language spoken more often than not, and coming to the Clyn Peninsula is in many ways like going to a foreign land. There is a language barrier, but it's not so much Welsh as the heavily accented English that local people speak. Once you've learned that Trith is beach and Harbour is harbour, you're more or less home and dry. There's no foreign frontier, no customs control, no duty freeze, but you have to pass a barrier of sorts to get onto the Lynn Peninsula. It costs fivepence to drive through Port Maddock. No, of course you don't need a passport, that's just a bit of Welsh fun. 
The tranquil beauty of the area is obvious, even though the weather wasn't too good when we visited. I guess that in Britain you have to regard sunshine as a bonus. Rain or shine, there's plenty to see and do hereabouts. There are first-class beaches on the north and south coasts and plenty of sea fishing and water sports facilities. At Abbasok, they were taking sport seriously. The local yacht club was holding dinghy races for all comers. Here, as elsewhere in Wales, one type of holiday accommodation is extremely popular. Many working farms now look upon the tourist trade as an extension of farming, harvesting profits from a crop of summer visitors. For families, a farm is a good base. At Gwynfryn Farm near Putheli, buildings have been converted to provide half a dozen apartments, sleeping from four to eight people. It's self-catering, though meals can be provided, and there's also a laundrette, games room, barbecue and play area. This is one of several local farms offering accommodation, inspected and graded by the Wales Tourist Board. If you mention Putheli in the context of holidays, then inevitably the name of Butlins crops up. In that sense, it dominates the Lynn Peninsula. But though the redcoats remain, much has changed. It's not a holiday camp anymore, but a holiday world and open to day visitors for £3.50 a head, £2.50 for the under-14s. The way you stay is different too. Butlins now has luxury caravans. A family of six can have a week for £347 in high season. For £15 more, they could have a Snowdon Lodge, a solid log cabin with two double bedrooms up and a third down. Very Scandinavian. Didn't I say it was almost like being abroad? There's a lot to see all over the Lynn Peninsula and many ways in which to see it. You can go on day or half day coach tours or use your own car if you've brought it. The Festiniog Railway on the other hand is transport and holiday experience all in one. Steam powered nostalgia, there's nothing to beat it. At Bedskelet, a few miles away in Snowdonia, a disused copper mine is now a tourist attraction complete with realistic light and sound effects and lots of social and historical information. Set in magnificent scenery too. Back on the peninsula's north coast, a place called Porthdinlin has a pub on the beach. The tea cock is popular, but never on Sunday. That day, the pubs stay closed around here. I said that coming here was a bit like going abroad, didn't I? But after two or three days, I thought I'd got over that feeling of being in a strange land. I thought I'd got this bit of Wales sorted out in my mind. And then I come across this. This, of course, is Port Merion, created over the years by a magnificent individual called Clough Williams Ellis. He built it just as the fancy or the fantasy took him. All sorts of adjectives have been used to describe it, but it can't be labelled by mere words. You can visit Port Merion for a few hours or a day, or you can stay here in one of 20 self-catering or service departments. The main building, damaged by fire, is due to open next month. Another local pub with a claim to fame is in the village of Saan. It's a cooperative owned and run by the villagers. The tea newish, they told me, is unique. So, naturally, we had a drink or two to celebrate that fact and the fact that the whole of the Lynn Peninsula has got a lot of good things going for it. The weather may not always come up trumps, but the scenery is spectacular, the people are friendly, and the area is crammed with interest. A couple of examples of the cost of staying at that farm. In low season, two nights self-catering for two people is £34.50, while a group of eight can have a week for £255 in high season. And that's all for this week. Next week, Annika Rice will be looking at a health farm holiday. I shall be on a fly-drive tour of New England, and we shall be seeing what you can do in Britain when it rains. 
In the meantime, remember that from March the 22nd, you won't just be flying from Gatwick. You'll either be flying from Gatwick South Terminal or Gatwick North Terminal, the new one. See you next Monday at 7. Bye-bye. <laughs>